This week on ACT OUT, Detroit would rather pay goons to steal people's water than make sure that people have access to water. Next up, you may know that Zuck appeared before Congress last week, but did you know that what he really did was appear before his employees? And Orwell's got nothing on the DHS and their new media list. Finally, Dr. Harriet Fraud joins us to dive into the psychology of the system, from what she calls the dethronement of white men to the effects of patriarchy on our mental health. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is ACT OUT. Welcome to ACT OUT, I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your Tipping Point. Picking up on a thread that we discussed last week, let's talk Michigan water. More specifically this week, Detroit water shutoffs. As the spring thaw comes to Michigan, the Detroit Water and Sewage Department announced that they would be resuming mass water shutoffs, targeting more than 17,000 households. So these shutoffs have been ongoing since 2014, when the city declared bankruptcy, decimating workers' pensions and jobs. And between 2014 and 2017, Detroit saw more than one in seven of its 677,000 residents lose access to running water. How the fuck, you might ask? Well, as per usual, follow the money. Democratic Detroit Mayor Mike Dugan was backed primarily by billionaire real estate and entertainment moguls such as Dan Gilbert, founder and chairman of Quicken Loans, and the Illich family, owners of the Detroit Red Wings hockey team and Little Caesars Pizza. The brutal policy of water shutoffs flows out of arrangements put in place at the behest of these wealthy interests, with the collaboration of trade union leaders who agreed to sacrifice city workers' livelihoods and retirees' pensions as part of the bankruptcy deal. A key part of the bankruptcy settlement was plans to sell off or privatize city assets, including the lucrative DWSD. So, in the fall of 2014, the Great Lakes Water Authority was established in conjunction with the firing of hundreds of water department workers in a move to privatize Detroit's water. Soon after, the water, the water shutoffs began in order to make the balance sheet of the new water authority look, uh, you know, more attractive to investors, which is what always happens with privatization, because corporations, by law, care about bottom lines, public utilities, I uh, care about public and utilities. And yet here it is, a grotesque and bloated corporate pus bag squeezing the poorest large city in the richest country in the world for water. Despite being right next to the world's largest fresh water supply, Detroit now pays more than two times the national average for water bills. No wonder people are falling behind. Similarly, Flint, Michigan, as we noted in last week's episode, is a mere half a, an hour and a half away from Nestle's bottling, bottling facility, which sucks fresh water from the spring in Everett, Michigan. Although that's the case, Flint pays 10 times more for its poisoned water than folks in Phoenix, Arizona, which you might know is in the middle of a fucking desert. Back in Detroit, the private contractors getting paid by the city to cut people's water at the street or indeed rip out water connections have just had their contract extended by Detroit City Council until 2021. In other words, Detroit is proud to pay goons to take people's water away rather than pay to ensure that people have access to water. Ladies and gents, capitalism. And speaking of the shittiest officials that money can buy, last week Mark Zuckerberg testified before the House Energy and Commerce Committee. And that is the committee that has authority over internet companies like Facebook. And in a perfect world, no, actually, in a world that even has mediocre democratic institutions, you'd expect that committee to be relatively impartial, impartial, to be able to sit there and listen to Fedbook's pleas of innocence in the face of clear election tampering and think, wow, uh, yeah, this is pretty fucked up. We should, we should do something to, you know, rein in Facebook. But alas, such is not our world. In fact, quite the opposite. First of all, how can a committee that represents the largest spying and manipulation network in the history of humanity be impartial on a case dealing with spying and manipulation? That's literally all the government does. Spy, lie, manipulate, repeat. 
Secondly, how can you be impartial when the guy that you're supposedly grilling is kind of your sugar daddy? Yeah, so in the 2018 cycle alone, Facebook gifted $66,150 to the House and Energy Committee. And that's more than any other House committee. If we look back at the 2016 cycle, that sum was over $100,000, the only committee on the House to break six digits. Well, gee, I wonder, I wonder if having Zuck as a sugar daddy affects one's ability to lay down the hammer. As Truthout noted during the hearing, Zuckerberg has asked for his own advice on legislation to regulate his company. Zuckerberg says he supports rules about consent, but adds, you know, we need to make it so that American companies can innovate with features that may be considered invasive. The moral of this immoral story, spies can't regulate spies, and until you remove the power structure of Congress being the paid employees of big corporations like Facebook, our laws are never gonna come down against them. Facebook and others, including our own government, will keep manipulating, keep spying, and keep getting away with it. And speaking of creepy Orwellian shit, our final update this week comes from the Department of Homeland Security, or what I like to call SS Light. Earlier this month, the DHS announced plans to, quote, track more than 290,000 global news sources, as well as social media in over 100 languages, including Arabic, Chinese, and Russian, for instant translation into English. The successful contracting company will have 24-7 access to a password-protected media influencer database, including journalists, editors, correspondents, social media influencers, bloggers, etc., in order to identify any and all media coverage related to the Department of Homeland Security or a particular event? Uh, anything related to DHS or a particular event? What particular event? Where? Any particular event? Okay, so you just mean life in general. And naturally, any and all media coverage means anything from your social media posts to the front page of the New York Times, and everything in between. Furthermore, the DHS wants this database to be browsable based on location, beat, and type of influencer as well as sentiment, i.e. my sentiment that the DHS can go fuck themselves. The chosen contractor for this blacklist will also need to be able to hand over contact details and any other information that could be relevant, including publications this influencer writes for and an overview of the previous coverage published by the media influencer. Wow. Big Brother is watching. So watch what you write, what you say, what you think, or else. Or else what? We don't know. The DHS had made, has made no comment on what it plans to do with all of this information, but hey, I'm sure that it's totally something non-invasive and democratic. That being said, when even Forbes is sounding the alarm on government and corporate collaborations, uh, you know that's gotta be some scary shit. And just in case the DH is watching the show, I'd, I'd just like to go ahead and welcome you to my show, you steaming piles of soulless, spineless, racist, bigoted, dumb-shitted, low-life scum. You low-life scum. Now, moving on, let's turn to psychology, more specifically, political psychology. What happens to our minds in a system like capitalism? What's triggered in an endless push to extract and oppress, to work yourself to death in order to live? Dr. Harriet Fraud is in a unique position to dive into these questions. Not only is she a mental health counselor and hypnotherapist in New York City, but she's also a committed radical and an expert on the overlap of psychology and economics. A little while ago, she sat down with us to stare into the abyss of the system from what she calls dethroned white men to how the patriarchy influences our mental health and more. Take a look. People are feeling the effects of a process that started in 1970 when family waged white workers were paid wages that could support dependent wives and children. That ended in around the 1970s. It began to end with outsourcing, mechanization, robotization, and very highly sophisticated computerization and multinational communication system. So the whole world could be exploited. You didn't have to pay a family wage to a white worker when you could pay $3.10, the average wage in Bangladesh or in India, $3.10 a day, that is. And they also could save money because you don't have to meet 
ecological standards, nor do you have to give workers protections. What a bonanza. Wild fortunes were made by a few, while the mass of white men were disinherited from their racist, sexist, lofty, well-waged position. And they are in shock and misery about it. I studied it for three or four months. There's so many mass murders to study. It's easy. They all had one thing in common, which is that they lost a girlfriend, which was a marker of male accomplishment or a job or both. Even the latest shooting in Parkland, Florida, the shooter girlfriend had just broken up with him. I mean, he also had a swastika on his gun, which they didn't think was so relevant and all sorts of white nationalists posts, but he's trying and a great make America great again. Ha. But what they mean by make America great again is make white men dominant because they have dependent wives and children and they earn family wages. It's the capitalists who destroyed their position, but that's not what you see on TV. And so they're not getting it. And, and they're very angry. They have been dispossessed of that power, that economic power to control women's lives, which was a marker of male accomplishment. Sexual assault is one way to reclaim that power, that power which is certainly quite popular as every day's news will reveal. And that's another thing that doesn't make white men as great as they used to be, because between birth control and women's economic power, we don't have to be with men to be protected because we're in sexuality, because of inevitable childbirth. Even though they're trying their best to remove abortion, there are still abortion rights here, as well as much more reliable birth control. And so, you know, men's position has changed. Now some men realize, okay, now I can be a person too. Now I can have feelings. Now I can have needs. Now me and my partner, male or female, could be real partners. We could share. I don't have to be the boss. But those are not the people who are shooting up America. Those are the dispossessed, enraged white males. Uh, you touched upon something interesting about the idea of actually being real partners. Uh, I was interested to hear your thoughts on how you feel this patriarchal structure of our culture damages men as well as more overtly women. Well, I think it damages men terribly. From the time boys are about four or even younger, you know, they're, they're not supposed to be sissies. If they're hurt, they're not supposed to cry and want to be embraced. They have to repress every feeling but anger, which is a male assertion. And so their tenderness, their fragility, their needfulness is repressed. And that's a terrible psychological thing to, to do to people. It makes them much more explosive, volatile, depressed, enraged. And that's why most suicides are committed by men, as well as most homicides and all the mass murders that we have, from teenage men to older men. It's because if you're feeling economically damaged, if you're feeling unmanned because you can't control a woman anymore and you can't get a girlfriend and you, you can't throw your weight around, and that's what you've been taught you're supposed to do, men are really lost. And that's a terrible, terrible thing for men. They've always suffered that way. And men felt that their only, this is a psychological thing, their only reasonable way of being vulnerable was around after sex. You know, they could affirm their sexual dominance, and that they are a real man because they have sex. And then later they could talk about their feelings. But once men are not with partners, 
they can't. It's not like women who break up and talk to their girlfriends about it and talk to their friends about it, talk to their parents you know, or their mothers about it and, and are allowed to bond. It's been women's job to be the social connectors of society, to invite the friends over, to invite the relatives over, to connect men with their children. So when relationships break up, men are bereft and lost. And that's very sad for them. So you have terrible vulnerability and fear and only violence as a way of showing you're really a man. Right. And so men are in very sad shape. My daughter said it very well about the attitude of women. I once said to her, you know, how when I was young, there was this old saw to get women to be virginal, which was why buy the cow if you could get the milk for free. And she said, you know what I say, mom? Why keep a pig in your house if all you want is sausage? <laughs> you know, women can be sexual without having to worry about as much about bearing unwanted children and having life dependency on a man. So that does change things. So moving beyond just the gun conversation, what about the bigger picture uh, of how our system, and you touched upon this with regards to, to, to dethroned white men, but how does our system affect mental health and the idea that capitalism triggers the worst in human behavior, the competition, greed, alienation, jealousy, and things like that? Yeah, well, the worst thing that capitalism does is it really works against connection. People need to connect with other people. When you're an infant, if you don't have somebody holding you and talking to you, you die. It's called failure to thrive. You stop growing. You can't have the milestones of lifting up your head or turning over because we all need emotional contact. And in a society in which, first of all, people who have jobs are working like crazy and then collapsing at home, you don't really have time and space to work on relationships, nor is that ever prioritized. The happy people drinking Cokes and trying to get you to drink Coca-Cola are acting like they are connected, but we are the only major country in the world. We're the only industrialized country, even Brazil, which is much poorer, to not have compulsory paid vacations. Brazilians have many weeks of paid vacation. The French have five guaranteed weeks of paid vacation. The German um, workers recently went on strike to have a better quality of life balance to work only 28 um, hours a week so that they can bond with their significant other people. So that we don't encourage, you know, if making money is the only priority, not having a decent quality of life, then you're really discouraging the kind of connection that allows mental health. So that, that's the biggest way. Of course, you need more mental health facilities and you need universal health care and subsidized mental health. Because right now, mental health care is expensive. And if you're insured, you can go you can go to the people on the insurance panel who generally are there because they can't get enough clients by themselves they're just starting or they're not as um, efficient they're they're not as successful so even if you have insurance you're not necessarily going to get top mental health care also it should be known that the people on insurance panels get it paid about a third of what they would get in private practice if people paid by themselves. So I have a psychiatrist colleague who said, look, I should be getting at least $300 an hour. So I see a lot of patients, you know, I see them for 15 minutes, work them through, give them meds, gets the same money. Bills for a session with the insurance. So even where you do think you have some protection, you sure don't have enough for mental health. And we don't have it built into a system of connections, which human beings need. The capitalist idea is the self-made man. But we all know they die without a mom. 
or somebody to hold them and talk to them and feed them. Um, you know, humans are the most dependent animals. And early humans were never found alone in caves. Going back again to the, the issue of gender roles, um, talk about the, the stereotypical gender roles and how we could shift from those stereotypes to more fluid and, you know, what you just mentioned, cooperative efforts uh, across the gender spectrum. Well, one of the ways that women have have made some changes is that we had a movement behind us that encouraged us not to be cute and dumb, but to speak out and speak up and speak up often and fight like a man, straightforward. And we haven't had that, that kind of initiative for men. And of course you could. I mean, what I imagine as I see the buses going by me in Manhattan is instead of ads with some movie where a guy has a gun and says, make my day, some guy vacuuming and saying, I want to get every little spot. Or bringing a woman a Chardonnay in her bubble bath saying, wow, have you had a hard day? You know, there are all sorts of things that you can do. You can have programs about that. You could really encourage boys and girls to be friends by the way you structure activities in preschool and thereafter. You could talk about gender. You could do a lot that encourages men to feel that it's okay to be tender. There, there was a story that I read recently about a school in Sweden, and this is part me shamelessly uh, promoting Sweden because I'm Swedish. But also, uh, there was a school in Sweden that basically said that they weren't going, they were going to be very uh, purposefully uh, going away from typical gender roles and that they would be, you know, letting boys play with dolls and making sure that, that, that boys and girls are not falling into these uh, stereotypical gender roles. Uh, and I was curious, because that was something that you mentioned, you know, like starting young, like, do you think that that's, that's something that should start in schools where we not only let boys play with dolls, but actually encourage it and encourage the girls to play with fire trucks. And Exactly. Encourage them. And also you'd have to then, because with a lack of child care in this country, people are raised by TV. You'd have to do something about children's programming as well as adult programming. But of course we should do that because they even use the pronoun hen for, mm -hmm. instead of saying girl or boy, it's like person. Come here, person, <laughs> let me show you something. That there's a, they are way in advance in their birth control courses start in kindergarten in Sweden, where they say if the, the bee doesn't pollinate the flower, the flower doesn't grow. And then they work up until junior high school and high school where they talk about having sex with another person. That's another human being. What kind of responsibility would you have to have to create another human being? And so on. And that's very important because they see each other as humans. So finally, I wanted to I wanted to get into the, the this the because I know that you were um, that you were part of the feminist movement, I guess still are. Um, and I wanted to touch on the, the problems with a feminism that pedestals the likes of Hillary Clinton or Gina Haspel or the CEO of Lockheed Martin, Marilyn Hewson. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on, on sort of mandating a type of feminism that truly is egalitarian and that truly does, is intersectional and inclusive? I think that's totally important. And I think that as a founding mother of the women's movement, we were too naive. We didn't realize that Gloria Steinem was a CIA agent. That still isn't on TV. It's on the internet if you look it up. We want, when she came up with Ms. Magazine, we thought, wow, isn't that great? Glossy magazine, no ads. We didn't think, ooh, where'd she get the money? That there was, there's a book called The Great Wurlitzer. There was a deliberate attempt funded, very well funded by the FBI and CIA to infiltrate the women's, the emerging women's movement and the black power movements to make sure that they were gender only and race only movements and were not about class. Martin Luther King was 
killed when he was talking about black and white together. We'll do it together. And um, so was Malcolm X when he changed his message. And Gloria Steinem quite successfully subverted our movement, which started, we started because we were thinking if we stand up, we were the lowest of all. Everybody will come up with us. And it changed to looking for equality within a system of greater and a greater inequality for the mass of people. The mass of women, I should say this differently, two thirds of women who are minimum wage workers, two thirds of minimum wage workers are women. The poorest people in our society are children. The second poorest are women with children. So that, and Hillary Clinton was not talking to them. Bernie suggested $15 an hour. And because she had to come up with something, she came up with $12.50. She had nothing to say about single mothers and support for single parenthood and universal health care and universal child care and after school care and summer care, which other Western democracies provide, like Sweden, like Germany, like France, or subsidized long parental leaves. And because of that, she wasn't a feminist for the 98%. She was a feminist for the 2%, or if you want to be generous, 10, 10%. But not a feminist for me is, is a woman who sees that all women deserve a chance. To learn more about Dr. Fraud and her work, visit HarrietFraud.com and please do check that spelling. And that will do it for this week's Dose of Dissent. Thank you so much for watching. Please spread and share this with all of your friends, foes, and people you don't know. As always, check out the last slide and the show description in order to find sites mentioned in this week's show. And for interim updates as well as posted videos, images, and articles, visit us on social media. From the Devil's Den, good night and act out. And real quick, to keep independent, non-corporatized media like this show going, donate at Occupy.com slash donate. If you'd like to donate directly to Act Out, visit Patreon.com slash Act Out. I'm not a fighter.